we can't hear you. Uh, maybe no, so I will try to okay. speak a little louder. And however, your phone cannot be here today, yeah. so today,
the explanation uh, from machine may change user behavior and potentially make the interaction between human and computer more natural and more efficient. So it's like the machine can not only give you an answer, but also kind of explain the answer. Then maybe the user will be more happy with the answer, and the user will be more efficient in, in getting useful information from the machine. Okay? And also from the AI policy perspective, uh, the EU has proposed the General Data Protection Regulation, uh, GDPR, which explicitly requires the personal, uh, personal data should be processed in a transparent manner. While the implication of this regulation is still to be clarified in legal practice, it is also, it, it also emphasizes the importance of transparency and explainability. Uh, however, the design and implementation of the AI-related policy is not a key focus of today's tutorial. Instead, in this tutorial, we will focus more on the techni technical perspective. We want to answer the questions like, is it possible to develop explainable AI systems? Is it possible to provide accountable explanations to users? And what are the technical responses to the regulations such as GDPR. And while the recommendation system and best search system are two most widely adopted AI systems on the web and have a great influence on nearly every web user, uh, we think that they are good platforms to develop, verify, and test explainable AI algorithms. So the explainable recommendation and search a very important research direction and has gained a lot of attention from the research community. And in today's tutorial, we want to give an overview and introduce the state of the art in this important research direction. Okay, that's why we need experimental uh, recommendation and search. And before talking about the research in this direction, we want to first introduce a uni unified view of search recommendation and explainability. And here we show a very brief uh, paradigm, a very brief overview of the search system. When using the search system, the user will first use the queries to express their information needs and submit the query to the search engine. And then receiving the queries from user, the search engine will try to retrieve relevant documents, relevant information from its information storage and return the search results to users. And to make the search explainable, besides the search results, we also want to return some explanations. If the search algorithm itself is explainable, we can generate some so-called intrinsic explanation which means that the explanation comes from the model, come from the ritual model itself, along with the search results. For example, the search snippets that we see every day is actually <coughs> can be regarded as an explanation for, for the search results. And if the search algorithm itself is not so explainable, we can also build an additional explanation engine to give an explanation for, for the results. This kind of explanation is often called post hoc explanation because we already have a, our own model and then we build a new model to generate explanation after we have the after we build our original model. And here is the situation for recommendation system. Uh, we can see that it is quite similar. The major difference is that instead, <coughs> instead of having an explicit query from user, we can only infer users' implicit information needs based on their profiles and uh, interaction history. The recommendation engine will also find items that can satisfy users' information needs uh, among the candidate items. 
and we can also have the intrinsic explanations than the recommendation algorithm itself is explainable. For example, if the recommendation is based on popularity of the item, we can simply generate explanations such as we recommend this item to you because it is the most popular. And if the recommendation algorithm itself is not so explainable, we can also use an additional explanation engine to generate the most explanation for recommended item. And from the previous slides, we already know that uh, we, we can already think that uh, there are a lot of similarity between recommendation and search. And we can also compare them along different dimensions. And here is the table from uh, I guess from this paper. And we can compare them along different dimensions. First, for delivery model, users pull the result in search. But the recommendation system can also proactively push the items to users. And the search only benefits the user because the user has their own information in and then they search. But the recommendation system can also benefit the provider of the item because it can give the item a higher level of action, exposure. And the search usually uh, we think that in search, that the user may not want an unexpected loot because they also they already have their information need. But uh, there's no hurry in recommendation, so having an unexpected loot may increase the user satisfaction in the recommendation setting. And both the uh, and both the search recommendation. <coughs> Can leverage collective knowledge and may depend on the context. And the main difference between these two systems is that in search we have queries from users, uh, but the, the explicit query is not always available in the recommendation. And because the recommendation and search are quite similar, we can have a unified view of them. In this view, given the user and context information, user history, user location, the search and recommendation algorithm will retrieve the search results or generate the recommendation based on a large uh, based on a large uh, information storage containing documents, product news, and etc. And in order to make search and recommendation more explainable, we can either use an explainable search and recommendation algorithm provide an intrinsic explanation or we can use a separate explanation algorithm to generate the post hoc explanation for users. And in this tutorial we will cover both the intrinsic explanation and post hoc explanation method for both uh, the recommendation and search problem. Okay, that's the whole picture of this tutorial, and here is the outline of the tutorial. Next, we will move to the part one, explainable recommendation, which will be delivered by uh, Qin Yao Ai. Generally speaking, recommendation system research can be broadly classified into five categories. That is, what, when, where, who, and why. 
For each question, there is a research tag associated. First, what? What to recommend is the fundamental problem of all recommendation systems. And one is related with the time of where recommendations. And also where is related with location based recommendations. Who is with social recommendations. And finally, why to recommend, which is the focus of this tutorial, is about explainable recommendations. The history of research on recommender system is more than 20 years to now. In the early days, recommender systems are constructed with simple yet explainable methods, such as the content-based model, the user-based library filtering, and the item-based library filtering method. In the content-based recommendations, we usually have item attributes and the user profiles, such as here. The similarity between the user and the item can be computed directly based on some semantic clear features, such as the keywords in the item descriptions or the user profiles. This can naturally explain why we recommended something to the user. In user-based collaborative filtering, we usually represent each user with a rating vector. For a target user, we first find her top K neighbors with some similarity function based on this rating vector. Then the preference from the target user to a candidate item is computed by averaging her neighbors, uh, her neighbors rating towards the target item. The explanation in this message can be provided in the forms like users who have similar rating with you highly rated this item. Next, item-based collaborative filtering is very similar to the user-based collaborative filtering. The difference is that we are now computing item similarity. We predict a user's preference on items based on her likeness towards the item's similar products. The explanation in this method would be things like, you have highly rated items that are very similar to the current item. For validating whether explanations are useful in recommender system, early studies design 21 types of different explanation interface, and they ask users to answer on how likely they would go and see each result based on the explanation. Here is some results we copied from the paper. So from the table, they show the mean response each user gives. It's like a rating, things like a rating, which is the higher the better each user gives to the inter different explanation interface. So in the result, they found that most explanations actually have positive effect on persuading people to click the results. And they also find that the most effective explanations are usually created based on the neighbor's rating. That is, we recommend something based on somebody similar to you, something like that. But notice that this is a work that had been done more than 10 years ago. As you may notice, most of the early recommendation techniques are non-machine learning methods. Although these methods have shown high interpretability, they are sometimes less effective in rating predictions. For solving this problem, machine learning methods based machine learning based recommenders model have been widely studied and used today. Among all machine learning based recommendation methods, the metric factorization or the MF is one of the most famous and popular ones. In Netflix competition, metric factorization measures has successfully outperformed the baseline with more than 10% in terms of root mean square error, or RMSE. Similar to previous measures, the basic goal of MF is to, is to directly predict the missing rating between a user and an item. To address this problem, the idea is to factorize a user item rating matrix 
into low-rank user and Python latent vectors. This usually includes two parts, the optimization of observed data, which is the reading we have here in this matrix, and also a regulation part that prevents our model overfitting. With the latent vector, we can directly compute the reading that hasn't been observed by multiplying the user vector with the item vector. In this way, we can achieve better reading prediction, much better than some traditional recommendation method based on the most popular stuff or the fabric filters. However, because we introduced this latent vector into the model, model based on matrix factorization is not very easy to explain. This problem could become even worse when we further apply more complex machine learning methods into recommender systems. For example, the original MNAF method can be treated as a shallow network where the latent factors is, uh, where each latent factor is a neuron. Today, the most state-of-the-art methods are built with deep neural network, which include multiple layers of neurons and nonlinear projections. It's usually difficult to align these additional neurons with explicit meanings. Based on the above introduction, a natural question here is whether we can develop algorithms that are both accurate and explainable to the users. In this tutorial, we will introduce five types of modern recommender systems that give you a basic idea of what are the existing effort on explainable recommendations. Here are the three, three topic we, uh, five topics we are going to talk about. The first one is explainable recommendation based on metric factorization. The second one is explainable recommendation based on deep learning. The third is knowledge graph reasoning approach. And the fourth is post hoc and model agnostic approach. So the first type. The first type of method we are going to talk about is a factorization-based method. Here we introduce four models, which are the HFT, EFM, learning to rank features, and MTER. I will go through each of the models. I will go through those model one by one. HIT is a review-based model. It has two parts. In the first part, it has a metric factorization model that learns the latent factor of users and items. And in the second part, it has a LDA model that learns the language model of user and item reviews. To link those models, HFT proposed a softmax function that directly connects the latent vector learned from the metric factorization with the latent vector, latent vector learned from LDA. Then, our goal in HFT is to jointly optimize the error of, the error of rating prediction and the likelihood of the observed user reviews. In HFT, the learned topic distribution can be used to understand user or item properties. For example, we can learn the characteristic of a user or an item by checking the top words in their topic distributions. However, such method cannot provide direct explanations on why a recommendation result is relevant to a user's need. So, based on this observation, in CIR 2014, a more explainable recommendation model is proposed, which is named as the explicit vector model. The basic idea of this EMF model and EMF is to recommend an item that performs well on features that the user concerns. To begin with, the method builds a user feature attention metric. The value of the matrix is determined by the times of uh, time that users have mentioned that feature in their review data. And also, it builds an item feature quality matrix. And the value is determined by the sentiments commented on the feature of this item. 
The overall model is optimized by a coupled metric factorization model that optimizes both the reading prediction error and the reconstruction error of the user features and item features. So here we have the user feature user feature metrics, <coughs> and here we have the item feature metrics. And above that, we also optimize the user item rating metrics, which is what we usually do for rating prediction. For generating recommendation list, EMF considered the overall rating of the user to the items, and also it considered the capability between the user's care features and the item's high quality features, like the matching between those two metrics. For example, we can pick the top K features that the user care and match them with the items that <coughs> with the item to see whether each item has satisfied the need of this user. For providing explanations, EFM predict a user's favorite features and fill it into the template. Such as here, we can see that you might be interested in this feature on which this product performs well. In 2016, a new model based on EFM is proposed for explainable recommendations, which is called learning to rank features. This model generalizes EFM by converting the user feature and item feature metrics into a user item feature tensor, and move from it moved from pointwise rating prediction to pairwise ranking loss to optimize user rating and review behavior. Later, a more complex model, which is referred to as the multi-text learning model, SHUT and MPER, is proposed for rec explainable recommendation in CIR 2018. This model proposed two texts for explainable recommendations. The first is user preference model, and the second is opinion content model. Here, we have a tensor of feature user opinions, and also a tensor of item feature opinions. Then to actually learn the latent factors, MPR jointly optimized those three tensors together. One is user feature opinion, one is item feature opinion, and another is item user grade. The relatedness of these tags is captured by sharing the latent factors among those tensors. Here are some results. And as we can see in the table, the explainable methods we reported here are much more accurate than the traditional methods like collaborative filtering and also selecting the most popular items. And this MP MPER con consistently outperforms both the baselines. <coughs> also, in, their pa uh, in the original EFM paper, they find that providing explanations actually improve the persuasiveness of the systems. So here they did an online experiment. The first group of results, uh, the group A, is people who receive personalized explanations generated by EFM. The second group, group P, and group B, is people who receive an explanation as people also view, which is basically the user-based fabric filtering. And this group C is a control group that receives no explanations. And according to their experiment, they find that people tend to interact more with those results that have personal personalized explanations. MPR design, MPER also designed an experiment to demonstrate its effectiveness on model explainability. Here, they do a cross-sourcing by lighting the turkers to judge how uh, to judge the explanation on five questions. The first one is, how satisfied you with the recommendations? The second is, did you, did you get some idea about the recommendations based on the explanations? And the third is, 
how, and that's the explanation, how do you know more about the item? And for this, do you think you gain some insight of why we recommended this for you? And five is, do you think explanation help you better understand our system? So according to their result, users do have different feelings of different explanations. But overall, providing good explanation is beneficial for recommender systems. Above, we have introduced four models. Their key idea is to assign some explicit meaning to the latent factors so that we can not only achieve better recommendation performance, but also enhance the explainability of the recommendation system. Here are some reference, and we will release our slide after the total. Other than the metric factorization, there are another type of explainable recommender model based on deep architectures. According to the type of auxiliary information used for providing recommendation explanations, the method can be further divided into two categories. The first one is text-based explanation and explainable recommendations. And the second one is image-based explainable recommendations. In text-based recommendations, we have seen two research lines. One is based on attention mechanisms, and the other is based on textual explanation generation. To begin with, let's list some work based on the attention mechanism. The first one we are uh, the first work we are going to talk about is the dual local and global attention model. This method concatenates review information for the user or the item into a large document and then design two attention models over this large document. The first attention model is called local attention, which learns which words are more informatic in a local window of words. And the second attention model is called the global attention, which learns which words are more informatic on all in the global context. With these two attention mechanisms, we also find that the local attention helps to select informatic words for prediction and, as <coughs> and can be used as explanations. Well, the global attention actually help us eliminate those unimportant words for better reading predictions. The second attention model we're going to talk about is the neural and uh, neural attentional reading regression with review level explanations. Similar to the former methods, all the reviews related to the users and items are merged together to form a huge document. However, in this method, the attention mechanism is conducted over the, over the reviews, not directly over the works. Different review will, have weight, will be weighted average according to the attention weight, which are jointly determined by the review content and the user item in value. According to the attention weight, the model can help us select more informatic reviews for user to re for user to reference. For example, for an item in the data set of Amazon toys and games, this model assigns low weight for the review of I bought it for my daughter as a gift because this review doesn't give you much information about the item. But the model can assign higher weight on more detailed reviews like the first one, these brush are great quality for children's artwork. Besides quantitative, uh, besides quantitative analysis, we also, also conduct quantitative experiments on the crowdsourcing platform. The first analysis is to verify whether the provided review explanations is useful for users to actually purchase the product. The comparison baseline is the reviews labeled as the most useful reviews according to the healthiness score. You know, on Amazon, on um, each review, there is a voting. You can vote this review to be helpful or not. The results show that the algorithm can select reviews that are much better than the reviews selected by the healthiness. 
And also, they did a second experiment on the relative comparison between the algorithm selected reviews and the reviews, oh, sorry, it's basically related with the first, uh, first experiment. And here, they show that 67% of the case, the selected reviews is at least e uh, equally well with the Amazon selected reviews. Another typical attention model for explainable recommendation is item level method in sequential recommendations with memory networks. In this model, the previously, and the previously interacted item will be organized into a memory unit. And the current prediction is based on the recently purchased items. The attention weight can reflect each previous item's highly influenced the current recommendations, just using a memory network. From the experiment results, the author find two types of user purchase pattern. The first one is called one to multiple, which means that an item consistently influences sequential user behavior. It may affect the user purchase after a month or in long term. The second one is one to one, which means that previous item influenced the current item, and the current item influenced the next item, and so on. The optimization attention mechanism has to provide explanation based on the existing reviews. However, in real world scenarios, it can be more flexible if we can directly generate explanations for recommendations. In this research line, the first typical model is NRT, which is proposed in CIR 2017. In this model, the user and item will predict the ratings and the review at the same time. The rating prediction is optimized by the RMSE, which is a very classic loss for the metric factorization, and the review is modeled by a recurrent neural network model. Once the model is learned, for a user item pair, this method can directly predict the reviews which reflect the user's preference on this item. We can use this generated reviews as the explanation we have for these recommendations. The generative explanations can also be realized in an adversarial man manner. Uh, adversary manner. So, in this paper of why I like it, multi-text learning for recommendation and explanations, the reviews of a user and an item are merged into a large document, and the adversarial, adversarial techniques is used to generate similar user and item reviews. The mediate user item representations are regularized by the reading prediction loss. The results show that this method can be more effective in providing explanations in terms of PI IBM scenario. So they evaluate the performance of the generated review based on the PI IDF similarity with the actual review that user has written for the item. In addition to tax explanations, in some real alternative tags like fashion recommendations, Zero explanations can be more intuitive and vivid for online users. A typical merely explainable recommendation is personalized fashion recommendation with zero explanations based on multimodal attention network. In this method, the image is divided into some small block based on which the author's design and attention mechanism to discuss the, and to discover which regions are more important for the current prediction. For providing more constrained and informatic supervision, the author introduced user review information into the framework and used a GRU model, which is another recurrent neural network, to capture the semantic of the reviews. The review information is expected to provide more guidance on the image region level attention. 
for evaluation of the effect things and for evaluation of the explanation effect things, I also conduct both qualitative and quantitative evaluations. First, the authors label a data set for the experiment. They randomly select 500 user random pairs in the text set, and they find some worker to label those uh, user item pairs. The image of the target item is equally divided into 7 multiply 7, which is 49 blocks. And the worker asks to identify 5 out of the 49 regions that are useful for explaining why the user purchased the item. For each label text, we provide two information sources for the workers. The first one is all the image and reviews of the product created by the users. And the second one is the specific review the user has written for the specific product. Here, the metrics are ranking metrics which represent how well the model can retrieve the five most important regions labeled by the workers. And as we can see in this result, after we include the review data, which is the VECF model, uh, the VECF model minus REDB is the model without reviews. After we include the review data, we can observe a significant improvement of the uh, performance of the explanation. From the result of the qualitative, uh, qualitative evaluation, we can also see some interesting results. For example, suppose that here is a review written by a user, and it actually mentioned that I like the design around the nose, and it image the model can actually identify this area is interesting to the user, which is where the nose is. As a short summary, in this part, we have talked about explainable recommendation based on both text and image with deep neural network. And most of the existing methods are constructed based on attention mechanisms. Which learn ways, which learns ways on different part of the input, and those ways can serve as the explanation for the recommendation. Also, there are uh, research lines that focusing on generating natural language explanations, but the study on this direction is still in an early stage. Here are some references. Next, we are going to talk about another type of recommend explainable recommendation methods based on knowledge graphs. As you may notice, in recent years, elevating knowledge graph to provide explainable recommendations has attracted a lot of attention in the research communities. Knowledge graph is a flexible structure which is easy to, in uh, easy to integrate various heterogeneous information such as ID information, tax information, or uh, brand, category, things like that. In addition, knowledge graph can provide us an opportunity to bridge the gap between symbolic reasoning and the neural model. Symbolic reasoning is well. Symbolic reasoning has dominated the AI community before the 1980s, and is more apparent and explainable. There are usually explicit rules that drive the final predictions based on symbolic reasoning mode. However, after we introduce machine learning, especially the deep learning techniques, we usually lost the explainability of recommendation system because we are treating it as a black box. Right now, Knowledge graph provides us an opportunity to build more explainable recommendations based on the knowledge we have extracted. And there are two research directions. <clears throat> First, in general, most of the existing knowledge graph methods can be are focusing on extracting explainable paths between the user and the entities. Based on the method they use, we can categorize the method into two. The first one is embedded learning approach, which learns some kind of user and item representations 
from the knowledge graph to embedded, then from the knowledge graph. And the second one is the symbolic reasoning approach, which is <coughs> which make recommendations based on the past reasoning beginning from the user entities to the item entities. So the first method, embedding based method. Knowledge graph database is a set of triplets that describe the facts in our life. For example, a triplet who contains a head, a tail, a relationship between them. Like here, Patty is born in Miami, so it can be treated as a triplet of Patty, Miami, and the relationship of born in. Knowledge graph embedding has been widely studied in recent years under the neural neural language under the natural language processing field. A typical model is called TransE. The basic idea is to represent each entity and relationship with an embedding, and the head entity can be translated to the tail entity based on the embedding of the relationship. There could be many ways to achieve this goal. For example, we can use the max margin loss to learn the, uh, the embedding of the entities and the relationships. A typical method on knowledge graph-based recommender system is the, learn, uh, is the paper on learning heterogeneous knowledge-based embedding for explainable recommendations. In this model, Gausser defines several entities and their relationships which are meaningful for the recommendation text, such as uh, write, also blog, also view, etc. And the entity embedding are learned in a similar way with the trans e model. When actually generating the explanations, the model finds the intermediate entities and compute the similarity between the users as well as the item toward the intermediate entity. The final explanation path is computed based on this uh, connectivity scores, which is computed based on a similar way with the trans e model. Another knowledge graph based model is called Reasoner. It was designed in the in 2018. The idea is to diffuse user preference on the knowledge graph and use memory network to capture the semantics of user preference. When providing explanations, the explanation path is constructed by selecting the most significant <coughs> entities in each hop. So in the beginning, we start from a certain item or user, and we just find each and uh, find the most significant entity around it, and then we do this iteratively to find a path to an item or user. Another model based on knowledge graph is proposed in AAAI 2019, which used LSTM to build the connection between different entities and used attention mechanism to fuse those paths to generate the final representations and explanations. The prediction goal and the prediction score for each item is derived by averaging the path between a user and an item through different entities. And after learning the parameters, the explanations can be provided by the path with the highest attention weight. The last embedding-based model is called jointly, uh, is in the paper of Jointly Learning Explainable Rules for Recommendations, which is published in WW 2019. This method incorporates the rule mining techniques into recommender system. The rules and the user item embeddings are jointly optimized in a learning process. Recommendations are provided by user history and the rule importance. For a candidate item, the model first computes ranking score based on the rules between items and each of the user's history purchase. And we compute a weight for each rule as its importance. The most important rule can serve as the final recommendation explanations. Although there are many promising results, 
this is inviting way to knowledge graph methods. It also and they also suffers from some limit and they also suffers from some limitations. For example, they usually have to define some meta task, which is quite time consuming. And also we have to enumerate all the candidate items in the evaluation to find the final explanation task. To solve these problems, reinforce, a reinforcement knowledge graph reasoning for explainable recommendations has been proposed in CIR this year. The model aims to train an agent which starts from a user and walk over the graph and reach a good idea node with high probabilities. The state of the agent is the current task and the reward is related with the characteristic of the reached item. If the reached item is a good item, then the reward are high. If it is not, then we have a low reward. In this model, the reasoning task, which means how the agent has reached the item from the user, can naturally serve as an explanation for these recommendations. As a short summary, in this part, we have talked about explain, uh, explainable recommendation based on knowledge graph. There are two types of methods. The first one is based on embedding learning, which learns some kind of user and item representations with the entities in the knowledge graph. And the second method is the symbolic reasoning approach, which recommend and which recommend stuff based on the reasoning path beginning from the user entity to an item entity. The final type of explainable recommendation method we are talking about, or we are going to talk about, is the post hoc and model agnostic explainable recommendations. There are two typical research. One is mining based method and the other is learning-based methods. Post-hoc explanations, <coughs> post explanations are generated after we train a recommender system, which means that here, we treat the recommender system as a black box, and we want to find some way to explain the behavior or the result of this black box model. First, suppose that we have a black box model, which is on the uh, left hand side, which is this recommendation model. Now, to build an explan explanation model, we use this rating matrix predicted by the recommendation model and mine some rules based on the rating matrix. That is to say, we try to mine some association relationship or other relationship directly from the rating prediction. Uh, the reading matrix produced by this black box recommendation model. The model mines two types of rules. The first type of rules is called the global rules, which is association rules mined with all users, where each user is treated as a transaction. And the second one is local rules, which is the association rules mined based on a, a specific users and the top k similar users for these users. For evaluation, they define a, a, a metric called modal fidelity based on the overlapping between the recommendation list provided by the original model and the recommendation list provided based on the global and local rules we mine through, uh, from the original metrics. This appropriate native neighbor and interest in this selection, 80% of the recommendations can be explained using this post hoc model. Another post hoc model is proposed in IGDM 2018, which used uh, reinforcement learning to assign explanations to recommendations. There are two agents. The first one is to use select explanations, and the second one is to use predict reading. For a candidate recommendation using an item pairs, agent, uh, agent one first selects an explanations, and then agent two derives a reading based on the explanations. 
the reward is computed based on the difference between the ratings, uh, based on the uh, discrepancy, discrepancy between the ratings from both components. In the experiment, they evaluate the explanation from two perspectives. The first one is consistency, which is defined as the Poisson correlation between the sentiment of the selected explanation sentence and the output rating of the recommendation model. The second one is explainability, which is defined as the closeness between the rating of the explanation agent and the recommendation model to be explained. Remember that here we are doing a post hoc explanation, which means that the original recommendation model is a black box. We just know its prediction, but we don't know the internal structure. As a short summary, in this part, we talk about post hoc and model agnostic explanations. There are two types of methods. The first one is mining based approach which extract association rules as post hoc explanation. And the second one is learning-based approach, which learn explainable model to approximate the unexplainable model, which is the black box model. For the future study of explainable recommendations, here are three important directions. The first one is the generation of natural language explanations for explainable recommendations. So as far as we know, there are not many studies on how to generate user-friendly explanations for recommendations. However, such study is very important to a future study of conversational recommendations. For example, in conversational recommendations, we need to answer why we recommended something during a conversation with the users. The second direction is the offline evaluation of explainability. Right now, recommendation explanations are mostly evaluated based on three methods. The first one is online evaluation with users, which is expensive and inefficient. The second one is case studies, which can only cover a small amount of case. And the third one is model dependent measure which is basically constructed based on the model. For example, in the post hoc explanations, we have a black box model, and we have a model that simulates the black box model. We can just evaluate it based on how similar those two models perform. So the question is, can we actually develop a general explainability measurement for explainable recommendations? This question is very important for the sustainability of future research on explainable system. And last but not least, right now we provide explanations to persuade people to like the result we show to them or to purchase the result we show to them. However, a good explanation are not just used to attract users. It should also help users to make better decisions and serve for the society. How to do this still is still unclear to them. And this is the first part of explanation, uh, explainable recommendation. And in the next part, uh, Jiaxing will talk about uh, explainable search. And we could take a small break, and if you guys have any questions, I'm happy to Oh, I mean, we can take a break for a question also.
for it. Yeah. 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 So, so comment on the, like, because I think most most of them 
some models with the network information, but it's not very true. Yeah, that's a good question. So the question is about the difference between the observability and the explainability. So when you're like in the machine learning community, when we talk about interpretability, it's more about can we explain the internal structure of the model so that we can understand its behavior of this that. And when we talk about explainability, it's more like letting the users or the developer understand why this item or things is relevant to the users uh, or yeah, the user things like that. And right now, uh, I think there are two types of, this, this, the difference between interpretability and explainability is actually related with two types of research on explainable system. One is model intrinsic model, and with model intrinsic approach, which means that we try to explain things by building a transparent model or the interpretable model, so that we can look at the details of the parameters or the result to see what exactly is going on. And the other is focusing on the model agnostic explanations, which is which means that we don't know the model, we just want to find the explanations. And from com well, cognitive sense, science, they notice that people have this kind of two paradigms when they start about decisions or things like that. Sometimes they will make decisions based on some logic reasoning, but sometimes they just have a feeling, make the decision, and try to explain why they make the decision afterward. So uh, the diff main difference is whether we know about the model or not, and I think both of the research direction is very important because you know, sometimes when you build a very interpretable model, it could be less effective in practice, especially when you model some complex data. So in that case, maybe post hoc or model agnostic explanations are more useful because you don't need to actually change the ranking model or the system you have. You just provide a possible explanation for the users, which could be attractive to a lot of users. <clears throat> Do you have like an example of a product or a service uh, that you've come across that does this better than anyone else? Uh, <laughs> or is it all terrible? <laughs> it's hard to say better than anyone else. I have observed some systems like this. Uh, one of the paper I presented today, uh, the one from CIR 2014, actually did online experiment on uh, JD.com, which is a uh, Chinese e-commerce uh, company. They just provided a small layout showing why we recommended this stuff to you. And according to the result, this seems quite promising. And today, Amazon also tried to do similar stuff by like providing something below each item saying that people uh, who view this thing also view stuff like that. Uh, I'm not sure whether those things are built directly based on collaborative routing model or more complicated model. But usually, providing those things can make people more interested in explore the website or the result. So, yeah, it's already 3.30. So let's move to the second part of this tutorial. Okay, so in this part, I will talk about explainable search. And here is the outline of the second part of the tutorial. First, I will introduce uh, the background and motivation of explainable search. And after that, I will introduce some existing work on this research direction. And I will specifically, I will introduce the work on building interpretable search models. Uh, work about using structured knowledge to build interpretable search models, and I will also talk about some work that use uh, that that try to generate post hoc explanation uh, methods for search, and finally I will talk a little bit about the so-called axiomatic analysis of search models. I think this kind of uh, research is is very it, it's a very interesting research direction in the IR community. And after that, I will make a short summary of the second part of the tutorial. 
and then we will have another QA session. So first, let's see the background and motivation of explainable search. I will answer questions including what is explainable search and why do we need explainable search. So first, what is explainable search about? Let's go back to the previous slides showing the relationship between uh, explainable AI and AI on the web. You can see that uh, explainable search is, is kind of like fit in this big picture. And given this background, explainable search study focused on one of the most important AI applications on the web, I would say, the search, the web search problem. And in a narrow sense, uh, explainable search is about how to build an interpretable uh, search model that's not only effective, but also interpretable. And in a broader sense, I would say that explainable search is about to re-exam the search problem from the perspective of explainable AI. I will explain it a little bit further in, 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 in the following slides. So from the perspective of explainable AI, why do we need explainability in the search context? Before answering the question, we, should, we need to clarify to whom we want to give an explanation. We can either give explanations to the end search user or provide interpretability to the system designer or of the search system. So first, for the search user, a search engine is actually an interactive tool to assess a huge information repository. And here's a very brief paradigm of search process. Uh, first, the user has the information needs. So based on these information needs, they will uh, formulate some queries and submit the queries to the search engine. And the search engine will return some relevant search results to the user. And the user will interact with these search results. And if their information need is satisfied, the search process will end. And if their information needs is not satisfied, or they have to come up new information needs during the process, they will do a query formulation and start this loop again. So, in order to use this kind of interactive tool, we argue that the user must have a correct mental model of the search system. They need to know about the capacity and limitation of the system. For example, in order to use the search engine effectively, they may need to know, uh, can the search engine answer natural language questions? Or can an image search engine find pictures based on the content similarity or identity? instead of just uh, based on the surrounding text. And they also need to know when they can trust the search system. For example, they need to uh, make judgment about whether those top ranked documents are good enough, and are they trustworthy, are they from the, uh, from the trusted websites, and also are they biased. And these this, this questions are becoming more and more important <coughs> because uh, people are Nowadays, people are use search engines to understand some very controversial topics. And they also need to know how to intervene when the search results are not satisfactory for them. They need to know how to do effective query formulation. And they also need to develop effective search strategies and search expertise about the system. So we think that uh, better explanations uh, for the search system actually can help the user build a better mental, mental model of this search process. And so a better explanation may help the user to make more effective search in the future. And here is an example of the explanation for search. Actually, we think that the uh, very widely adopted search snippet is an example of explanation. You can see that uh, th these snippets are crawled from Google, and we can see that the query snippets are query centric with keyword highlighted. It's kind of like trying to explain why the system retrieved this document and rank it at top position. And it's also very interesting that Google also showed that 
I visited that Wikipedia page before. So, so that because I have visited this page before, so I might be trying to refine it. So, search deep is, is kind of like an explanation for the search results. And in a recent study in CIR 2019, me and Zhang start to trying to investigate the interpretability of the search result summaries. In a user study, they ask the participants to provide feedback for the transparency, accessibility, and usefulness of the search result summary. And in this table, they show their definition of transparency, accessibility, and usefulness. And by analyzing the feedback from user, they found that first, the user think the current result snippets are highly transparent and accessible, which means that the user do regard the search result summary as an explanation of the system's decision. And second, the interpretability uh, measured by the transparency and accessibility do influence the expected usefulness and click decision of the user. You can see that if the transparency and accessibility increase, the expected usefulness and the average click rates also increase. And users are this result suggests that users are less likely to click on a result link if they do not understand why it was retrieved, uh, which, which is measured by the transparency, or cannot assess if a result will be useful based on the summary, which is measured by the accessibility. Okay, so that's for user. And to the system designers, uh, we think that the objective of the search system is roughly to like, estimate the relevance between each query document pair and use, it, use the estimation of relevance to rank the document when given the query. So we need to build a retrieval model to uh, estimate the relevance between uh, query Q and document D. Oh, sorry. And we be developed a lot of virtual models. For example, we have the more traditional TF-IDF, BN25, and query likelihood model uh, as virtual model. And we can also build link to rank models and provide different kinds of feature. Oh, sorry. I, I, I just skip a slide, sorry. So, oh, yeah, this slide. So let's start from here again. <laughs> okay. So the objective is to build a retrieval model that estimates the relevance between uh, the query Q and the document D. And we usually evaluate the retrieval model by a, 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 a range of different evaluation metrics. For example, we can have online evaluation metric based on relevance. We can compute MAP and DCG for the rank. And we can also do online evaluation. We can do A-B tests and use the click through rates or the number of set clicks as an online metric for the ranking performance. But we argue that the even metric itself are still incomplete descriptions of the search task. Uh, so the interpretability may help when we don't have a complete description of the search performance and search problem. For example, the interpreti interpretability may help with the understanding of relevant itself, uh, that is to answer why a document is relevant to a query which cannot be captured by any of the image metric. And, and, and actually this is a very fundamental question in IR. And since we can build a ritual model to estimate relevance to some extent, to interpret the ritual model can help us to understand the relevance itself. And second, at a global level, the interpretability can help with a more comprehensive analysis and evaluation of the search model. For example, we can answer questions like why the model works and does the model overfit our test sets? And does the model has the desired properties such as fairness, accountability, and credibility, something like that. And also at a local level, 
the interpretability can help us to diagnose and debug the model for some specific examples, for some specific query document pattern. Uh, we can answer questions like, with a higher level of interpretability, we can answer questions like, why the model fails for some queries, and how to handle the bad cases. And another trend that are happening recently is that the ranking model are becoming more and more complex. At the beginning, we can we, we, we use the very uh, not very simple. We use the retrieval model based on text such as TFI, DF, and twenty five, and the query likelihood model. Query likelihood model, and then we start to use the many correct model that can combine different kinds of features. And now with the rapid development in deep learning, uh, a lot of neural IR model are proposed. And as the model are becoming more and more complex, there's a trade-off between the effectiveness and interpretability. And understanding how this more powerful but more complex model work has become a new challenge to the system designers. So that's why we need experimental search for from the user's perspective and from the system designer's perspective. And now uh, we are trying to answer the second question, how can we make search models more explainable and, and interpretable? And in this part, we will introduce uh, four different ways to achieve this goal. The first one is to build interpretable search model. So first, let's see how can we do that. If we look at the interpretability of existing trans uh, existing retrieval model, we found that some of them are quite explainable. For example, here is the formula for the well-known TFIDF model. Uh, from the formula, we can already see that it is based on the exact match between the query tense and document tense here. And we can also see that this model uh, models the importance of query tense with the inverse doc document frequency, IDF, which means that the, the, the terms that are, that are more, uh, have, has a low document frequency will be more important. And it also allows a diverse matching patterns, which means that no matter how this term match happens <coughs> in different position, or in different order, that the, the relevant score estimates by this formula won't change. And actually, it is easy to understand how and why this model works, because it is designed to capture these signals that may be important and useful for ranking documents. So in order to make retrieval model more interpretable, we can also design and integrate interpretable components into our models on purpose. And here I will introduce one of the uh, widely adopted neural IR model, the DRNN model propo uh, proposed by uh, Professor Guo Jiafeng. And as an example, to show that how to make uh, interpretable neural virtual models. And here is the overall architecture of the DRM. And we first will build a local interactions between each pair <coughs> of turns, each pair of turns, and each pair of turns from a query and a document based yeah. on the uh, embeddings of these turns. And then uh, turn it into a matching histogram. After that, we will employ, we will use the uh, multi-layer feed-forward matching network to produce a matching score for each parameter. And finally, the overall matching score will be generated by aggregating this matching score for each single turn with a turn gating network. So I will introduce uh, each layer. So that's the first layer, the matching 
uh, the matching histogram mapping layer. And in this layer, we compute the cosine similarity between each turn in the query and each turn in the document. Then we will compute the histogram of the cosine similarity map, uh, values. And, and here we, we use uh, three slightly different mapping functions. We, we, we use the uh, count-based histogram, and we also try the normalized histogram at the log count-based histogram. I will uh, compare the performance in the results slides. And the histogram layer is kind of like a pudding layer because it can uh, map these various size interactions. Actually, the interaction is the interaction score can be arranged in a in a metric of uh, the dimension of LQ times LD, right? And it's a very size matrix. And the histogram uh, layer can pulling can can do a pulling over this interaction matrix to produce a fifth flat rep representation for the interactions. And uh, and for the ex exact match, the cosine similarity will be one. So we use a special bin in the histogram to count the frequency of exact matches. Okay, that's the first layer matching histogram layer. Then we will pass the outputs of the fixed length outputs of the matching histogram of each query turn through a standard feed forward network. And uh, yeah, oh. yeah, yeah, you, you can ask question anytime. Yeah, so can you turn to the yeah. Um this was the term uh the common square between the term and the document term. I get the How is the cosine similarity is and also whether the back provision can pass smoothly in the Yeah. Actually it's a very good question. First the 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 turn imbalance are computed based on word to vect, I I I think. So it's 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 a pre trained uh, embeddings of turns, and actually the uh, gradient cannot pass the histogram layer. So there are some follow-up work that change this histogram layer uh, to the kernel, the soft kernel histogram. So the kind similar, but then the gradient can pass through this layer. I see. So there's a new for the network actually uh, start from the histogram. Yeah, true. Okay, so then we, we will like use the output of the matching histogram and feed them into the uh, standard feed for a matching network and compute the matching score for each part turn. And after that, we will use the turn gating network to compute the importance of uh, each query turn. And here, we use two different inputs for the turn gating network. Uh, the first one is we just use the embedding vector of the turn. And the second one is that we use the inverse document frequency of the turn as the input of the turn gating network. Which means that in this layer, we try to model the importance of each query turn. And to test effectiveness of DRM, we conduct experiments on two test collections. The first one is uh, robust 04, and the second one is CoolWeb 09. And here is the some statistics of the data set we use. And we use a five-fold cross-validation to evaluate our model. And we, we tune the hyperparameters of the model towards MAP and we evaluate the model based on MAP, NDCG, and Pursuit at 20. And here is the results on the first data set. And the results suggest that uh, DIM performs better than, than both the traditional ritual model, the Parallelage model, and BN25 model, and the recently proposed neuron IR model. And this these rows are for the recently proposed IR models at that time. 
I think it's 2016, uh, yeah. And the results are similar on the other data sets. And it is also interesting to investigate the performance of DRM under different configurations. Note that we, use, we can use different configurations for the uh, matching histogram layer and different configurations uh, for the time gating layer. And in the result, we, we, we can see that uh, the count based histogram mapping is better than the normalized histogram mapping first which suggests that the document length actually plays an important role in ad hoc retrieval. And we also find that the log count histogram method is even better. This indicates that there's a sublinear transformation it will be useful for reference management. That we, we need to con consider the document length, but uh, the contribution of the length, the contribution of more term matching will be sublinear, okay? And we also find that the, uh, the IDF-based term gating works better than the term vector-based uh, term gating. Uh, a possible reason for this is that the DIM uh, with the term vector-based gating function uh, simply use too many parameters, so it cannot be trained sufficiently on our data set. Uh, but these results again demonstrate that the IDF turn uh, weighting is very effective for ad hoc retrieval. Okay, so that's the first work we want to introduce. We can see that the DRM is based on neural network. It's, it's, uh, it's more complex than the traditional retrieval model, but because we designed this model uh, in this ways, so we can still like make it inter interpretable. Okay, and we can also leverage the structural knowledge to build an explanation explainable search model. Now we will introduce the uh, second study that leverage knowledge base embedding to build an explainable product search model. Uh, and. <clears throat> and actually this work is similar to the work that used knowledge graph embedding in recommendation. And the motivation here is that we want to uh, conduct reasoning on the knowledge graph as a form of explanation. But reasoning with uh, hard rules over knowledge graph is inefficient and difficult to generalize. So we use knowledge graph embedding to help with the reasoning on graph and generates explanations based on the knowledge graph. So we also, uh, so we can also represent the relationship between user, item, reviews, and other information like the category and the brand of items in the form of knowledge graph. And here is an example of the knowledge graph that has all kinds of information in it. And here we treat the search and purchase action as a special relationship where the where the relation embedding and okay let's see. Yeah here the red arrow is the, the red arrow represents the search and purchase action. And all the other relationship the embedding of the all the other relationship is trained use the uh, knowledge graph embedding method. But uh, for the search and purchase relationship, uh, we use a dynamic, uh, this, the embeddings of this kind of relationship is dynamically uh, determined by the query terms used in the search. And here is how we uh, compute the embeddings for this specific relationship. Then we can obtain the embeddings of each node in this graph by training a whole chain C model on the graph. Okay? So it's like we use an embedding to represent all the other relationships except for the 
dynamically determined search and pur purchase uh, relation, and then we train a chance the uh, knowledge graph embedding for the whole knowledge graph. And once we have the embeddings of the user, item, and the query, we can generate search results by ranking candidate items according to the similarity between the vector for the user U plus the vector for the query FQ and the vector for the item I. And we can also generate explanation by finding a path on the knowledge graph that connects the user and a retrieved item. For example, uh, for the path from Alice to fashion to dress, we can generate, from Alice to fashion to dress, we can generate the following explanations that we, we retrieve this dress for Alice because she often writes about fashion in her reviews and fashion is frequently used to describe this dress by other users. Okay, so we, we search with the knowledge graph embedding and we generate explanations based on the past on the knowledge graph. And to test the effectiveness of the model, we conduct experiments on the Amazon product data sets. And because there's no publicly available query logs for product search, and we generate synthetic queries based on a three-step approach. First, we extract the multi-level category information of an item, of a purchase item, and then we kind of like concatenate all the terms uh, in the multi-level category as a topic string. And we remove stock words and duplicate words from the string as a like a synthetic query here. And then we test different models, test different retrieval models, use the synthetic queries. Okay? So here is the baseline me method we use in this study. We also use the query like model, BM25 model as the traditional retrieval model. And we also use the Lendermart uh, uh, learning to rank baseline. And we also compare our did this work, the performance of this model, with the recently proposed uh, product search model that based on embeddings. And here is the results of search performance. We can see that uh, the explainable product search model is uh, actually performs better than the baseline model. And it is interesting to see that by using more type of relationship, and here is the model that used all kind of relationship in the knowledge graph, uh, the model can achieve a better performance. And here are some examples of the explanations generated by this model. And the synthetic query uh, is this string like uh, from this query we can see, see that it seems that the user no actually it's not the user so here is the query we generate based on the data set okay and here are some explanations for a specific item that we can find on this graph yeah so it's it can highlight the different kind of information like the brand or the category because this this item uh, this entity is also on the knowledge graph. Okay. So that's the second work uh, I want to introduce. This work similar to the work in recommendation, we can use knowledge graph and we can conduct reasoning on knowledge graph. To provide kind of like a, uh, to, to provide an explanations for the uh, product search model, and then uh, we will introduce the post hoc explanation method for search, and con and know that uh, the first two study I just introduced 
are all so-called intrinsic explanation model because the explanation is actually uh, generated by the retrieval model itself. Okay, and here I want to introduce the post hoc explanation method for search. Uh, the post hoc explanation means that we construct a second model to interpret the train model. One of the advantage of the post hoc explanation method is that it is usually model agnostic, which means that we can apply the method to any trade model. So now uh, I will introduce a study published in Wisdom 2019 that proposed a post hoc explanation method for search. The primary goal of this model is to aid users in answering the following question after the search engine show the search results to them. First, why is this document relevant to the query? Second, why is this document ranked higher than the other? And third, what is the intent of the query according to the ranker? And the basic idea of this work is to adapt the line model to search task. So before I introduce that work, I will, intro I will briefly introduce the line model. The line model was proposed in 2016. It stands for the line stands for local interpretable <coughs> model agnostic explanations. The basic idea of line is the following. For a train model F, for a train model F and an instance X, we try to find an interpretable model G in a local neighborhood of x defined by pi x. If we use a loss function to measure the fitness of g and a function pi i to model the locality around x, then the objective of line is to minimize this function. Okay, it's kind of like we we trying to minimize the difference between the train model F and the interpret model G uh, in a locality around the instance X, X defined by pi X. And here we show an example of how can we uh, define pi X and the loss function. And usually we, we use a very simple and interpretable uh, model for the model G. For example, we can use the sparse linear model as our interpretable model G. And here is a graph from the original work of line that shows uh, we can fit a simple interpretable model to uh, provide a the linear decision boundary uh, near the instant near this instance for a very complex decision boundary generated by the original trade model F. Okay, so that's line. So the remaining problem is how to apply line to such task. And here we use a, a linear SVM on turn space as our interpretable model. And for document D, uh, we can generate instance in this neighborhood to define the locality around D by randomly removing some terms in D. And for such task, the train model is usually a ranker, which means that it can rent a set of documents according to its relevance. Uh, however, it is easier to apply line to a binary classifier. So the author for this, this study uh, designed the following ways to convert any ranker uh, to a binary class, uh, to, to convert any ranker R into a binary classifier B. The conversion is based on estimating the probability uh, that a document is relevant. And the top K binary strategy simply treats 
all the top eight documents as relevant, and the score-based method estimates the relevance probability by comparing the score against the most relevant document. So only the most relevant documents will have a relevance probability of one. And the rank-based method estimates the relevance probability uh, by the rank uh, by the rank that is computed by the ranker R. Okay, that's just three different ways to convert any ranker into a binary classifier. So then we have a binary classifier and we have our uh, interpretable model and we define the uh, locality around uh, around the instance we want to explain. Then we can try to answer the three questions that we want to answer. The first one is why is this document D relevant to the query? So to answer this question we can first feed the linear SVN for document D uh, and then use its coefficients to generate explanations. And here is the is a screenshot in, in, in their study that shows why uh, this document is relevant to this query based on uh, the coefficients of the linear SVN model. And for the question why is uh, document DA rank higher than document DB. We can use, uh, we can set the rank of DB as the parameter K in the rank based conversion strategy and train the interpretable model of DA. Uh, we call it MDA. And then the coefficient of MDA will reveal which words are strong indicators of relevance when compared to uh, document DB. Okay. And finally, for the question, what is the intent of the query according to the ranker? We can aggregate, aggregate all the coefficients of MD, where D is the is a top rank document, and show the top words and coefficients to the user. Okay, so that's the third work I will introduce today. And in this work, we adapt a post hoc evasion metric, uh, post hoc explanation methods to the search task to generate explanations that can answer through different questions that the user may be interested in when they, uh, when they see the search results. And finally, I will, I want to introduce some research uh, that is called the axiomatic analysis of search model. And I think this kind of, of approach is very interesting because it actually originates in the IR community. And to conduct an axiomatic analysis, uh, we will first seek a set of desirable properties of ritual models as formal constraints or axioms of ritual models. Then with this formal constraint, we can analyze and diagnose the ritual models. And we think that such analysis can provide theoretical guidance on how to optimize the ritual model and how to design new ones. The idea of axiomatic analysis of search model originates from Fung's paper in CIR 2004. In that paper, they define seven formal constraints on ritual models. And they also analytically exempt three representative ritual models with this constraint. Uh, they empirically show that the satisfaction of this constraint is correlated with good ranking performance. 
and the violation of the constraint often suggests that the model is non-optimal. So uh, the constraint can be used to find uh, optimal ranges of parameters. And this table lists the seven relevant constraints proposed in Fang's paper. Uh, you can see that there are three turn frequency constraints, TF1, 2, 3, two uh, length normalization constraint, LN, C1, and 2, and one turn discrimination constraint, TDC. And we will introduce some of them as examples of uh, what uh, what a formal constraint, what a assume, assumes for ritual model look like. So first, let's see the first constraint, constraint the TF, TFC1. The intuition be, behind this constraint is that uh, the ritual model should give a higher score to a document with more uh, occurrence of a query term. So here, let Q be a query and D be a document. TFT requires that if we append a query term to document D to get D1 and append a non-query term to D to get D2, the relevance score of D1 should be higher than that of D2. That's the first uh, relevance constraint, the TFT1. Then for then uh, then I will introduce a few of these constraints one by one. Then for TFD2, the intuition is that we need to require the, the amount of increase in the score decrease as we add more turns to the, to the document. So formally speaking, let Q be one turn inquiry, be Q, and D be a document. If we append the query the, the, the query time Q to the document twice, then the amount of increase in the relevance score for the first time will be larger than the amount of the second time. So which means that uh, the increase here will be larger than the increase here. Okay, that's TFD2. And for TFD3, the intuition is that the model should favor a document with more distinct query turns. Suppose that the query consists of two turns, uh, W1 and W2, and the total number of exact matches of these turns are equal for two documents, D1 and D2. And if D1 contains both turns, but D2 only contains W1, then the relevance score of D1 should be higher than that of D2. Okay, that's the third uh, term frequency constraint. And the term discrimination constraint aims to penalize the words that are popular in the collection, which is similar to the intuition behind IDF. Suppose we have two document, uh, suppose we have two documents that have an equal number of exact match but DE contains more Q1 that has a larger IDF value, then D1 should be more relevant than D2 because it contains more discriminative terms. Uh, okay, so that's the uh, term frequency constraint and term discrimination constraint. And here we also want to look at the length of the document intuitively. If the length of the document is longer, it will more likely to match more query terms. So we need we need the length normalization constraint. The LNC1 aims to penalize long documents. It states that if a document D uh, D prime contains one more non-query terms than D, then its relevance score should be smaller than D, which means that if we add uh, if we add irrelevant terms to the document, it will actually uh, make the relevance score decrease so that we can penalize uh, long documents. 
However, the LNC1 requires the model to have a length normalization component. And we also need to make that this component will not overpenalize known document. So we further define LNC2. It states that if we simply duplicate the, the document D for k times, then the relevance score will, will be no less than the original document D. Okay, it's kind of like the, the intuition be, be, behind LNC2 is, is not that obvious, but uh, it should be like used uh, along with LNC1 because LNC, the intuition be, between, uh, behind LNC2 is to avoid over penalizing the long document. So in the original paper, Fang showed that the author showed that the satisfaction of this constraint is correlated with good empirical ranking performance of traditional IR models. And as the axiomatic analysis is kind of like a meta analysis over different models, it should also be useful in analyzing and optimizing the neural IR models. So after more than 10 years, so the recent work in this year start to adopt, uh, adapt the axiomatic analysis methods for the recently proposed neural IR models. And I will introduce uh, three work in this direction. The first study we want to introduce try to create a diagnostic data set based on the relevance constraint including TFC1. TFC2, uh, TDC, MTDC, which is a modification version of TDC, and LNC2. And here is the pipeline uh, to generate the diagnostic data sets. Uh, the, original, sorry, the original data sets will first be filtered and pre-processed. Pre After that, we can sample uh, query document pairs that match the conditions of the constraint to form the diagnostic data sets, uh, which means that uh, for a query document pair, uh, we will generate like a pair of documents uh, similar to the way we just introduced this kind of relevant constraint and use them as a diagnostic data set. You know that here we only generate the pairs based on the constraints and we don't need any relevance annotations in this pipeline. Okay, so after building the diagnostic data set, we can use it to evaluate certain retrieval models by testing to what extent the model can satisfy the constraint. The order tests six different retrieval models, two traditional one, BN25, and query likelihood model, and four neural ones with the diagnostic data sets. Uh, and they find that there's a po positive but not very significant correlation between the MAP score, they, they compute the MAP score based on, the, based on their own relevance annotation. There's a positive but not significant correlation between the MAP and the average fraction of the instance that satisfy the axiom of six different constraints. Okay, it's kind of like the idea behind this work is if you believe in these assumptions, then you can generate test pairs based on this assume to evaluate your virtual model without any relevance annotation. And they kind of like evaluate this kind of evaluation process by comparing uh, the, the results in this kind of method with the empirical ranking performance measured by MAP. Okay, that's the first work. Yeah, of course. Yep. Table. This table or oh. this one? Yeah. 
So they compute these these values based on their own relevance annotation, and they compute these these numbers by like if I sample 100 pairs, and your ritual model will give a relevance score for these 100 pairs, right? And they compute how many pairs that satisfy the constraint. So the the relevance score in, in, in that kind of formula is actually produced by your ranking models. Okay. Mm, so yeah, that's the first study in in the direction of applying axiomatic analysis for neural models. And here is the second one, which is from SIGA 2019. Uh, in this work, the researchers used the formal constraint as additional regularizations in training the neural ranking model. And for a document D and a constraint, uh, they call it uh, delta i, they will generate a perturbed document D. Uh, perturbed, uh, they, they, they call it uh, di. And to regularize the ranking model with a pairwise hinge loss, that is uh, increase. They, they will increase the loss if the ranking model fails to satisfy a constraint that I on the pair D and DI. Okay, and here is the axioms they use in this study, and here is how they perturb uh, document D to to generate DI. And they use the TFD1 with two different uh, perturb per perturbation methods, which the, the first one just adds uh, a term in document D, and the second one uh, deletes a, a term in document D. And they also uh, incorporate the TFD3 and LNC to regularize their uh, neural ranking model. And they conducted experiments on the MS macro uh, ranking data sets and used the CKNRM model as the ranking model. Uh, and here is their results. The result shows that first, the uh, asthmatic regula regularization can improve the ranking performance. Uh, from this figure, we can see that uh, this line is for the uh, asthmatic regularization CKN RM model. And we can see that the regulation is more effective when you have, uh, when the size of the training data is limited. When you have less training data, then the regulation will be more effective. Um, and from this table, we can find that uh, the turn different, uh, the turn frequency constraint are in general more effective. However, adding the uh, length normalization constraint can bring a little bit further uh, improvement because yeah, here is the performance when you add all the constraint, all the axiomatic regularization to the original CKMI model. So that's the uh, second work which uh, try to use the uh, axiomatic axioms to uh, regularize the training of neural ranking model. And the third study is also from CIDA 2019. The motivation of this study is that uh, as the retrieval model tries to uh, approximate user's relevance judgment, maybe we can find some human-inspired heuristic constraints by investigating how the user makes relevance judgment. So we first conduct an eye checking study to log user's eye movements during relevance annotation task. Mm -hmm. By analyzing the collected eye checking data, we found that uh, user's reading process during relevance judgments can be char characterized 
as a two-step process, uh, two-stage two process. In the first stage, the user will read the first part of the document to have a preliminary relevance judgment of the document. And then in the second stage, the user will read the, the rest of the document with the pre preliminary relevance judgment. And if the preliminary relevance judgment is that the document is relevant, the user will read the document to acquire useful information. And if the preliminary judgment is that the document is irrelevant, the user will quickly skim the rest of the document. And based on the eye tracking data and the two-stage reading model, we propose six human-inspired reading heuristic, which kind of like similar to the uh, formal constraint we just introduced. And with this uh, human-inspired reading heuristic, we can also analyze whether existing IR models satisfy these human-inspired reading heuristics. And we analyzed eight recently proposed neural IR models and found that none of them satisfy all the reading heuristics. Here is the uh, reading heuristic we found in the user study. So we further designed a neural retrieval model that we try to satisfy all the reading heuristics. And because we found that the user will not read the whole document to, read, to, to make a relevance judgment, uh, we use a reinforcement learning model here to incorporate the selective attention and early stop within heuristic into a neural retrieval model. Actually, we, we, we build an IR-based agent to, to select the important terms and to decide uh, whether the, the, the user, actually the, the user here is the, uh, is the relevance model, whether the user can stop reading from, from here. So we use an IR agent to design to make this to make these decisions. And after we making these decisions, uh, we build a rank ranking model on top of that to like produce the final uh, relevance estimation and the uh, and the ranking model and the IR agent will be jointly optimized so uh, using uh, by the loss function of whether this relevant estimation is good or not, whether this relevance estimation uh, matches our re relevance labels. And experiment results show that by incorporating all the effective human-inspired reading heuristic, the proposed RIM model, we call it reading inspire model can achieve a better ranking performance than other neural ranking model. And here is the performance of our model. And here are some recently proposed neural ranking model that we use as baseline. OK, that's the third work in the direction of axiomatic analysis of a ritual model. And that's all. And here is the outline of the second part. Oh, sorry. And we will do a very short summary of the second part. And in the second part of the tutorial, we first introduce the background and motivation of the problem of explainable search. For the first question, what is explainable search about? We think that, in a narrow sense, it's about how to build an interpretable search model. And in a broader sense, it is about how to re-examine the search problem from the explainable AI and ML perspective. And we argue that the explainable search is important because for search users, in improving the interpretability can help them to build a better mental model for the search system and search process. And for the system designers, a higher level of interpretability may help them deal with the more powerful but also more complex search models and systems. We then introduced an existing work 
that are related to explainable search. And we know that some of the work does not explicitly mention the term explainable search. And this is not an exhaustive survey of all the research in this area. However, we are very lucky that uh, the work we introduced in this tutorial actually covers two dimensions of interpretability, whether the explanation is global or local, and whether it is an intrinsic explanation method or a post hoc explanation method. And that's all. And so we are we have we, we still have like twenty five minutes for the QA session. is that I, I can repeat it. Sure, yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. It's like you you generate embeddings for item and and query and user and how you find the path to generate the explanation, right? Correct. Yeah, so about finding the explanation path on the knowledge graph. So when we finish training the model, we have an embedding for the relationship for the entity, so that we can actually project each entity into different uh, embedding space. So suppose that I have a user, I have a relationship called um, like, uh, just an example, and then this relationship should link a user to a certain um, words or item so that I can use this relationship to project that user into the item space or the word space. Then using this projected representation of the initial user in the new space, we can find some uh, nearest neighbors that are around that uh, projected users. So suppose that in this word space, the word fashion has a high similarity with the user's representations projected by uh, the relationship called written. So then we can, or we can assume that there's a strong connection between the users and the words near the user's projected representation in the word space. So in this way, we can measure the uh, connectivity of the entity in different space so that we can use this connectivity to compute a path between the users and the uh, an item in the item space. Finally, we just use the path with the highest connectivities as the final explanation path to generate the explanations. Uh, I'm not sure whether that uh, answers your questions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sure. But also, uh, it, it's somehow really you're trying to find the, some path between whatever entities that you have or say that you have people here, you have two parts of that, say that the entity, the relationship, and now you're trying to find the other entity, right? <clears throat> In, uh, the other question for embedding, embedding the graph, is not very trivial. So uh, how, how do you do embedding? Is it like a triple thing that you are trying to embed, say that you have two of that, you're trying to guess the, same, the third one, or uh, it's a fusion of data that you are trying to embed? What, what do you embed? Oh, uh, so the question is about how do we actually, uh, what do we actually embed in this knowledge graph, and how do we actually learn the embedding? Yeah. yeah. So we actually use the transe model, which assumes that um, for each uh, relationship triplet, the head entity should be able to be translated into the tail entity based on the embedding of the relationship. So in that model, it's just a linear model. Suppose that we have a, a triplet. So the embedding of the head entity 
added uh, add the embedding of the relationship should equal to the embedding of the tail. That's the assumption of the transient model. So in this way, we can learn all the embeddings by optimizing some uh, minimum margin loss. Like I just minimize the difference between the head entity plus the relationship embedding and the, the tail entity. So in this way, we can learn all those knowledge embeddings. And finally, we can use them to generate the explanation paths. Okay. Thank you for asking. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.